So uh, Carlos Moffat is our physical oceanographer. Megan Semino is stepping in for Bill Frazier, who had been taking care of the penguins since the 70s. And then uh, Hugh Ducklow uh, has stepped out of the program, and Ben Van Moy from Hui has joined it. So um, we're sad seeing some other people move on, but we're excited with our new members. So uh, we're a model system, we think, for polar marine ecosystems that are undergoing change. In the upper left corner, you see a picture taken from the Mar Glacier. You can see Palmer Station sort of down there with those posts. The red circle um, where you see all that rock and dirt, that used to be covered by the Mar Glacier when I was a graduate student. And so we've seen the glacier in the heat essentially retreat a couple football fields. And you can see rivers now running on the surface of the glacier and the mottled black are little meltwater ponds. So we're seeing glaciers retreat, we're seeing regional uh, ice melting. You can see three panels down on the right, north, south, and far south um, as a function of month. And back in the 70s, um, you see more white, and then it declines as we move to the present. Um, and this is rippling through the food web. So in our conceptual model, um, the amount of sea ice structures the ecosystem and the amount of sea ice is really regulated by the amount of ocean heat, um, driven by essentially the position of the circumpolar current, which is the largest current on the planet. Um, and so when you have a polar system, that current is offshore, there's a less delivery of heat, and the sea ice is uh, large winter seasons. Uh, and that's what we consider a polar system, and it favors specific organisms, Adeli penguins, krill, etc., and a lot of carbon by geochemistry. Um, in a subpolar system, um, that sort of circumpolar current is closer to the continental shelf. There's a lot more heating, more mixing, and you transition into a subpolar ecosystem which favors different species. In our new proposal, we're focusing on some of the drivers of it. And so we have, over the long term, sort of the climate press of heating, um, we have climate cycles, El Nino, La Nina, the southern end of mode. Those are decadal press pulses. And then we have synoptic pulses that now we think play a much larger role than we considered. And so those would be extreme storm events. And that essentially modulates the degree to which you're subpolar or polar. So here we are looking at the time series. Upper panel shows you sort of climate cycles, southern annular mode, and the ENSO cycle. It's the phasing of those two modes that drive a lot of the variability we see, at least in our time series so far. The panel below shows the rising air temperature. Um, winter, we've seen winter air temperatures in the last 50 years increase by almost five degrees, and with it, a decline in sea ice. However, uh, when a few of us joined the LTR um, back in 2008, there was a large recovery in the sea ice, sort of giving us sort of a resilient experiment, because we've always had the question of, if you brought the sea ice back, would the system just transition? Uh, we saw leveling off of phytoplankton uh, growing, um, and a sort of bump of krill productivity. And then you see the penguins down below. So we still see subpolar penguins, those are chin straps and gen twos, you know, climbing over time, but then stabilizing and reaching a plateau as we had this recovery in sea ice, and we see the Adelis, which had been declining, um, essentially also plateau. We did not see recovery. Um, part of that's life history of the Adelis, and the next year or two will really determine whether there'll be any uh, Adeli recovery based on the sea ice return the sort of last 10 years. The system is now going back into a warming phase, and the sea ice is starting to decline. So we had seen that krill had sort of increased and this was always considered a sh very short food web with krill being the keystone. So we'd sort of expected the penguins um, would have shown a response, but they didn't. Um, one idea that had been sort of in our area for a long time is the whales might be a competitor for food. They had been uh, hunted almost to extinction in local areas and have recovered dramatically. So on the left you're seeing foraging kernels based on radio tagged uh, penguins and whales. The Adelis, the polar penguin species, you can see their foraging range, it's distinct 
from essentially where the Gen 2 penguins, the subpolar penguins feed. They also seem to be segregated in the depth of the water column. You can see the whales actually are very happy um, with essentially the Adeli area. Um, but what we have noticed is, is that going through the statistics, we're not actually seeing uh, food as being a big driver in these local coastal communities. And, and on top of it, the whales seem to be pregnant every year. So um, that got us thinking about these other events, which were the storms. And so if you look at um, chick fledgling mass, that determines whether you're gonna survive your first weather weather winter and the years where we have extreme storms blowing through here an extreme storm is sort of 50 knot winds maybe 70 miles per hour lasting for up to five days um, it has a big impact on the chick fledgling weight and so we're going to be adding these short-term heterogene heterogeneous effects uh, over the next six years if we do well in our reviews so thank you very much thank you oscar